I mean, if, you, if you're all the baseball players, you probably want to have a spokesman who somehow is, is working. But the aim of the spokesman would be different than the aim in a traditional union. It wasn't the whole need for the unions with the Taylor model because the people at the lowest level. No, it actually goes back to the middle, middle of the 19th century. It's, it's an effort for people to aggregate themselves into groups that can talk about their life. If you have lots and lots of people doing this, they may well want some kind of association to discuss doing it. But the goal of discussing in a Deming world is totally different from the goal of discussing in the Taylor pyramidal world. Here it's, a, here it's a fight. I mean, this person is above me. They don't understand my life. They're going to try to force me to do things I can't do. They'll fire me if I can't do this, even though it's not my fault I can't do it. In this world, you're all on the same team. You say that the Taylor organizational structure is more adversarial. As Much more. This, this is an inherently adversarial power structure. This should be an inherently team collegial power structure. OK? Very big difference. I only remain Speaker of the House as long as I convince a majority of 230 of the Republicans that I am listening to them well enough that they should rehire me. They are my consumers. And the minute I forget that, I have, I have two sets of consumers, 600,000 Georgians and 230 House Republicans. And the minute I forget that, either set of consumers can fire me. And it's a wonderfully market-oriented system in that sense. It's, very, it's a hard system, but it's market-oriented. But the first goal here, and it's something, think about education. Who is the consumer? Students that can, actually there are three consumers, the society, the parent, and the student. Remember, the student's not paying directly. The student is being paid for by the parent and society to achieve three sets of goals. But now go back and ask yourself about the typical learning situation we currently create. If those three are defining it, who defines it today? The politicians, the bureaucrats, and the, and the professionals. Second principle. The producer invents value. Nobody knew they wanted to go to McDonald's till Ray Kroc copied the McDonald brothers' plan. Ray Kroc, remember, this, this is one of the great stories of, of how history unfolds, because it's not linear. It's not from here to here to here. Ray Kroc was what? Anyone remember? Milkshake, uh, milkshake machine salesman. He wanted to sell milkshake machines. He was the best milkshake machine salesman in the country. And the McDonald brothers had a great product based largely on their french fries. And lots of people came to McDonald's. And he went to them and said, you guys ought to franchise. If you would franchise, now why does he want, to, want them to franchise? Sell more, milk, sell, more sell more milkshake machines. And they said to him, we won't do it. He said, if you'll just expand, I could do it. And they said, we don't want to expand. We're happy being the McDonald brothers. So he finally, after two years, talked them into letting him expand, at which point he gave up being a milk. Uh, shake machine salesman. But it was all a historic accident. The minute he opened McDonald's in Chicago, people flocked to it. And he suddenly said, this is really a winner. You know, by the way, do you know why they use Coca-Cola? The regional Coke salesman loaned him the equipment. He was an entrepreneur. He was a small businessman. He's getting off the ground. And they said, we'll help you. We like your idea. We want you to succeed. Someday you'll be a good customer. Notice how Deming-like this is. OK? Let us help you be successful. Well, guess what? The largest single customer in the world is for Coca-Cola, McDonald's. Out of one local guy being positive. Now, in this model, of course, or in this model back here, finance would have said you did what? OK? Principle number three. To improve future results, you must improve the process, which means if you're serious, and this is why Deming and Drucker blend together so brilliantly. If you're serious, you have to map the process you're engaged in. You have to always be thinking process. What am I learning about the process? So you can't focus on the event. The event is, oh, I did this number. It's part of a process. Show me the map of the process. What does the chart look like? Okay, so you're constantly improving the process because it is the process improvements. My silly example. You have a phone which is too far from your desk and the cord is too short. So 12 times a day, you have to stand up and walk over to the phone. What is the obvious answer? Get a longer cord. Get a longer cord or move the desk. Move the desk. It may seem obvious. 
Great managers do it instinctively. Bad managers get up 12 times a day for their whole life. <laughs> OK? Fourth, people have intrinsic motivation. They want to do a good job. Very important part of this. The average human being wants to do a good job. Uh, it's an assumption about human nature. Doesn't mean that they're good, they're necessarily good people. Every one of us has some potential for evil. Every one of us has to go through a process all of our lives of sorting out how we live out our potential. But most of the time, most people inherently would prefer to achieve rather than to not achieve. And you can acculturate to increase that tendency. Because the basic tenet of America, I mean, if, if, if we're endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you're assuming people will pursue. I would argue that if people wanted to do a good job, they wouldn't see the social problems that we see today. Unless you have a system which is telling them not to do a good job. Remember, the person down here who's not doing a good job maybe be, is being sent signals all day to keep their mouth shut. Personal welfare is being sent signals all day, don't, go, don't try. Why would you want to get off Medicaid? Why would you want to leave public housing? You don't have any personal friends who work. Why would you want to work? Why would you get good grades? Talk, talk to, to black kids who get good grades in inner city school and the peer pressure they're under to not succeed. I mean, humans will, humans I think have a desire to be good, they have a desire to be liked, they have a desire to achieve. But they can be broken of those desires by a system which repetitively pounds on them to teach them bad behaviors. Why wouldn't you get pregnant? All your friends are. I mean, you just think about it as if you apply Deming, if you read, if you read uh, uh, Leon Dash's book, When Children Want Children, and think of it in a Deming model of a system and a culture and a process, you have a totally different view of what happens. And we'll get into this when we get to the, the section on the culture. But, but our presumption here, it's, it's at a core part of Deming, it's why Deming is so American, is that people basically want to pursue happiness. Now, if you don't believe that, you need a dictatorship. You need a police state. But if you believe that, then you ought to design a system that starts with the idea, probably you want to do well. Now, if you're one of the tiny, tiny percentage that don't want to do well, we can deal with that. But for most people, most of the time, it is safer to assume they want to learn, they want to grow, they want to do well, and we are the facilitators of their behaving in a positive way. Principle number four. Well, Jack, Jack Kemp has a very simple, we'll, we'll keep the, this chiron up. Jack Kemp has a very simple theory in the baseball strike. His theory is that uh, when the marginal tax rate finally broke 50% by the time you count in state taxes, that if you're a normal player who knows you've only got a six to 10 year playing career, that the marginal tax rate makes you much more desperate than you were when it was 28, and that the tax increases have a direct impact on why the players are so concerned because they're actually making much, by the time you take out the agent's fees and you take out the tax rate at the state and federal level, they're actually taking home much less than people think they are. And these guys know that they're probably not gonna play more than 10 or 12 years. So they've gotta build up in that length of time the entire nest egg uh, to sustain the rest of their life. I mean, it's a, they're huge salaries. And I don't, I, don't, I don't feel any sympathy for a guy who makes $7 million a year and feels poor. But that if you really evaluate as a system in a Deming model, and said, now what happens to your salary? Tell me how much your agent gets. Tell me how much the union gets. Tell me how much the tax get collector gets. How much is left? And you're 26 years old and you're a pitcher and you may, and you may not have 10 more years. How worried are you? And they're in an adversarial environment. I mean, they and the managers, have, they and the owners have had a lousy relationship culture. On both sides, on both sides. You've got, you got owners who've made bad decisions. You got a players union that's made bad decisions. And instead of in a Deming like model stopping and going, I mean, what they ought, I think what they ought to do, frankly, is go off on a retreat and not come out until they, you know, if you took every owner and every player and you said, we're now all going to go to Yellowstone and we can't leave till we have a solution, they get one. They talk to each other. But until you can unlock that, as long as you keep it adversarial, back to this. Well, these are just the players. I am the owner. Who do you think you are? Okay. 